Federal law requires a permit for all commercial filming, no matter the size of the crew or type of equipment. This includes individuals or small groups that generate revenue by posting footage on websites such as YouTube and TikTok. We've been covering a whole lot of drama around rules for filming in national parks and on other public lands for the past several years. Now there's a new change, and they're specifically calling out YouTubers and TikTokers. Let's talk about it. Hi everybody, I'm Jason. This is RV Miles, and here usually we talk about the news surrounding RVing and camping, and this is no exception, except for today there's going to be a whole lot of opinion interspersed with what's going on with the rules for filming in national parks. Now, if you're not somebody that goes into parks and records and posts it for monetary gain, you might not think that this applies to you, but this affects us all. If you are an American, the rules surrounding filming in national parks and the recent court rulings that have been involved affects free speech across the board. And we're gonna get into that a bit today. But first, let's talk about the history of filming commercially on federal lands and why this is even an issue in the first place. Back in 2000, 22 years ago, a law was passed that required the National Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Bureau, the Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service, all the government federal land agencies to issue permits and collect fees for people filming commercially on public lands. Nobody wants James Cameron plopping down around Old Faithful with a crew of 50 people to film a scene for the next Avatar movie. We all know that that is something that should get a permit and the taxpayers and the federal government should receive some money for the time and resources involved in that process. If it's allowed to happen at all, of course, we don't want to ruin the visitor experience of all those folks that went on vacation to visit Old Faithful. But that law was written way back before YouTube. It was written before all of us had smartphones that we could just press a button and record a video. And the landscape of who is a filmmaker has changed dramatically. And especially who is a commercial filmmaker. Just to put it into perspective, as of one year ago, there were two million YouTube channels that were involved in the YouTube partner program, meaning they collect money for the ads that YouTube displays on their platform. There's countless others on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and all the other platforms out there. People making money off of a small hobby or what could be a complete profession as it is for me. On the flip side, there are lots of people that are filming on public lands non-commercially. People filming student films, for instance. People filming for a nonprofit. People filming for their own personal use. Those people might be doing the same things or even bigger than a commercial creator might be doing. So when that law was passed, we didn't know what the world was gonna be like. And it actually took the National Park Service and all the other federal land agencies many years to come up with rules around what that meant because the law was written in a confusing way. It just required permits and it required money to be recouped and didn't really explain what commercial was. It did leave some openings for newsmaking and we'll get to that in a bit. Now, in 2019, a filmmaker named Gordy Price was filming his film Crawford Road in a National Park Service site, and he received a citation for filming commercially on public lands. And what happened in the past when this would happen is if you resisted, the National Park Service would drop the case. They didn't want to go to court over this law because they knew there was a good chance that there would be a bad finding against it because there really is no good definition for what is commercial filmmaking. Does it mean making a few bucks and not a profit? Does it mean making thousands of dollars? Does it mean posting something to YouTube on a non-monetized channel, but YouTube is still playing ads on that and YouTube is making revenue off of it? Nobody really knows because it wasn't clear. And the way the law works is based on definitions. So the government backed down with Gordy Price, but he decides he's going to sue them anyway for infringing on his rights. And what happens is a federal court knocks down the law with the judge saying essentially that if you are charging a permit for a commercial film, but not for a non-commercial, you are putting an unreasonable restriction on free speech. The type of content commercial or non-commercial, narrative or documentary, the type of content cannot be a consideration when the government denies free speech, at least according to this judge. So what happened? The National Park Service dropped its rules. It said everybody was allowed to commercial film 
on public property if they wanted to, as long as it followed all the other rules of the park. You couldn't disrupt the visitor experience. And that's what we've been going off of for a couple years now. But the National Park Service appealed that decision, and a three-panel judge in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals voted two to one to reverse the ruling. And there were some really striking comments in that ruling, with one of the judges saying essentially that the creation of the content is not protected free speech. That's where this affects us all, folks. They're saying the act of actually creating the video, because you're not presenting it in a theater, you're not protected because you're not communicating free speech, you're making speech. And the act of making it is not protected. The third judge dramatically disagreed. This is what he said. By stripping public forum protection from filming, my colleagues for the very first time disaggregate speech creation and dissemination, thus degrading First Amendment protection for filming, photography, and other activities essential to free expression in today's world. He said, my colleagues reimagine the public forum to protect the stumping politician, but not the silent photographer, to shield the shouting protester, but not the note-taking reporter, he wrote. These distinctions find no basis in First Amendment jurisprudence. It makes no more sense to exclude certain types of speech from public forums than it does to police which squirrels may enter a conservation easement. He added that by stripping filming of the protections afforded to expression in public forums, the court puts us in direct conflict with other circuits and leaves important expressive activities unprotected in places where the First Amendment's guarantee of free speech should be at its apex. It's those places of free speech that I want to talk about. So everybody wants to protect public lands. Everybody wants to protect national parks. National parks are some of our favorite places on earth, partially because they are so beautiful and picturesque and great for taking photos and videos of. But the law that we're talking about here isn't just national parks. It's all federal lands. And even some of the lands under the National Park Service are not necessarily what people think of them as. If you wanna go film a protest that's happening on the National Mall, on the White House grounds even, the White House is a National Park Service site. You need a permit to do that. You need to file for that permit 14 days in advance. Now there are some exceptions for breaking news, but on a lot of the Park Service sites, they contend that if you are a newsmaker, you have to prove that you work for a news organization, even saying that if you are a freelancer, you have to show some sort of contract or document that you work for a verified news organization, whatever that means. In this era of citizen journalism, that's absolutely absurd to me. So the ruling gets overturned and the National Park Service takes some time to decide what they're going to do. Many of us had hoped that the new rulemaking process that began after the price decision would continue. That the Park Service would set some new rules based on the new era that we are in. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Just a few days ago, the Park Service updated their commercial filming rules on the website again. They say effective October 28, 2022, the National Park Service rescinded interim guidance that was in place during litigation regarding commercial filming and has returned to longstanding laws and regulations governing the commercial filming in parks. So when is a permit needed for commercial filmmaking? Under federal law, all commercial filming that occurs within a unit of the National Park System requires a permit. What is considered commercial filming? Commercial filming means the film, electronic, magnetic, digital, or other recording of a moving image by a person, business, or other entity for a market audience with the intent of generating income. Examples include, but are not limited to, feature film, videography, and documentaries. Does commercial filming by individuals or small groups require a permit? Federal law requires a permit for all commercial filming, again, no matter the size of the crew or the type of the equipment. This includes individuals or small groups that don't use much equipment but generate revenue posting footage on websites such as YouTube or TikTok. That's certainly me. Now, they do go on here to say that the prime focus of the National Park Service is on commercial filming that has the potential to impact park resources and visitors beyond what occurs from the normal visitor use of park areas. Examples of this type of filming are productions that use substantial equipment, such as sets and lighting, productions with crews that exceed five people, and filming enclosed areas, wilderness areas, 
are on locations that would create conflicts with other visitors or harm sensitive resources. So essentially they say they don't want to come after the folks that are doing small filming like me. But the problem is I want to follow the rules. I need a permit because now you've made this system where a permit is required for commercial filmmaking. I am a commercial filmmaker. I, I need a permit now. You can't just say to me, well, okay, I'm okay with what you're doing. I'm not going to require you to get a permit for that. No, it's either permit or no permit because now you're putting me in a situation where I, if I have to prove to somebody in the future that I had the permission to do this, I don't have a physical permit. The act by which we permit people that are doing things that are otherwise restricted is giving them a permit. So I need a permit and the process of getting one is a little bit challenging. This probably wouldn't be that big of a deal if it was easy enough to just walk up to the visitor center, say, I'm a YouTuber, I'm here hiking with my family, I have a GoPro, I'm gonna be filming our hike. I'm not gonna be doing anything different than any other visitor, but I would like to pay my $20 permit fee and get a permit. That would be easy. The problem is, it is not that easy. And in fact, you can't just get a permit. You can get denied for a heck of a lot of reasons. And there are many places where you just can't get a permit at all. Let's look at Channel Islands National Park for a second. This is a place that we're considering going to very soon. Channel Islands says that they need a minimum of two weeks advance notice to consider and process permit applications. The additional time is required due to the logistical complexities and nature of the park. They're all a little complex, and most of them say between 10 and 14 days. It is recommended that applications be sent via email to the park's film permit coordinator to expedite the process. Now, let me say, I have tried to contact the park's film permit coordinator to no response a couple days ago. So the process begins with me trying to contact them to get some information before I actually file the permit. And then I have to wait to see if I actually receive a permit. And there are lots of reasons you might be denied a permit. In fact, the rules say that the Park Service can deny a permit if they don't believe that the film that you are making is beneficial to the public. Now, I don't know what that means, but it seems like it can be interpreted in a lot of ways if the Park Service doesn't like the message that you are putting out there. And believe me, I've been covering the National Park Service for six years now, and I have been critical time and time again. There's been theft, there's been embezzlement issues. There are all kinds of issues that happen on public lands that need to be covered by the news media, including citizen journalists. And the news exemptions require it to be breaking news. So if I'm covering a, I don't know, a melting glacier, that's not breaking news. Uh, breaking news being something that requires you to get to the park and film faster than a permit can be filed for. So uh, the restrictions on the news media are extremely intense as well. Now let's look at Joshua Tree. Joshua Tree has specific locations that you can get a permit for. There are many places in the park you cannot even get a permit to film in. In fact, the entire national park system, if you want to film in a wilderness area, you just can't. You cannot get a permit to film in a legitimate wilderness area. Wilderness areas are places where they don't allow structures and roads to be built. You can't bring motor vehicles into them, but often you can hike through them and camp in them. You can't film in them, meaning you can't take out your iPhone and take a video of your hike. That is a big problem. Joshua Tree also has blackout dates that you can't get permits at all during the year. Now let's go to Independence National Historical Park. Independence says, filming and photography, whether commercial or non-commercial, will be allowed within the park provided that the activity is consistent with the park's purpose and does not pose a potential threat to park resources, create an unsafe or unhealthful environment to visitors, unreasonably interfere with park programs, unreasonably interfere with the atmosphere of peace and tranquility, interfere with the NPS concessionaire or contractor operations or services. All that makes sense. Those are rules that anybody can follow commercially or non-commercially. Permission to film or videotape within the park buildings may be granted by the superintendent when the activity has a meaningful and accurate association with the historic resource. I guess they consider the movie National Treasure historically accurate. And when the production would contribute to the public understanding and appreciation of the historic resource. But get this, commercial filming in all buildings within the park must take place during those times the buildings are closed to public visitation. You can't film in Independence National Historical Park inside any of the buildings, period unless you have a permit to film after hours. And guess what? When you film after hours, you're paying not only the permit fee, but you're paying staff to be there. 
So I'm sure by now most of you are wondering what does this permit process involve? And I alluded to the fact that it is a little bit difficult to get a permit. It's not as simple as just going up to the visitor center and getting one. Here's the permit itself. Okay, so this one is from Independence National Historical Park, but they all look pretty much the same. They all have similar fees involved. First of all, you have to know that the application fee is somewhere between $100 and $200. It seems to vary per park. Uh, Channel Islands application fee was $166. Uh, the Independence National Historical Park, I believe, is $120. Those are non-refundable fees that you don't get back whether or not you get denied for the permit. You have to fill out applicant name, social security number, tax identification number, your address, your telephone number, fax number, email address, a bunch of information about the project, the detailed description of on-site activities. So, it's not just as simple as saying, I'm going to be there and I'm going to film. You got to tell them exactly what you're going to be doing, how you're going to film it. A location schedule, the date, location, the start and end time, the activity and the number of cast and crew involved. I got three kids. They're a wonderful cast. What equipment you're going to be using. Description of equipment, backdrop, sets, props. Attach additional pages if necessary. Number of vehicles, cars, SUVs, pickups. Vehicles greater than 10,000 pounds. Oh, by the way, I should mention, I am in a public campground right now and campgrounds almost exclusively you're not allowed to film in. I'm inside my RV, does that count? Nobody knows. A list of contact signature, and then you have to provide insurance. You have to provide liability insurance, naming the federal government in case you damage something. You have to send this paperwork in, you have to send a check by mail, and you have to hope that you're going to get approved. Now here I want to remind you, we're talking about the National Park Service. The National Park Service is one of the biggest landholders in the country. They're not the biggest though. 28% of America, 28% is federal land. And this law sets a precedent, right? And that feeds down to state parks and local parks as well. Basically all government owned land. What kind of rules can they set on that land? This is a big problem because it really does restrict free speech in an age where everybody has a camera. Everybody has a cell phone. I have a very nice camera that I'm looking at right now. It has a record button for taking videos. It has a shutter button for taking photos. I can set up the exact same way. I can point my camera at a bison and I press that photo button and I'm legal. I press the video record button and I'm not. To me, that's no different than saying you can sketch this lake with pencils, but you can't do it with pastels. And yes, by the way, I haven't talked about photography yet, but photography has much simpler rules, much clearer rules, rules that make a lot more sense. You can take photos on public lands as long as you are not using models, sets, props, or any more equipment than a tripod and a camera. That makes a lot of sense to me. If I'm not building a set, if I don't have a cast, and by the way, they have defined models to mean actors or people that are selling a product and not your family that you're recording. And if you want to shoot photos of a wedding, if you want to shoot photos of a product and you want to do that on public lands, you apply for a permit and you get a permit. That sounds great. That makes a lot of sense. My camera shoots 30 photos a second and puts them together into what we call a video. It is no different. It is the same equipment. In fact, I could go on public lands. I could go set up a giant production and have a rehearsal and never press the record button. And apparently that would be legal because I'm not filming, I'm rehearsing. The rules should be about having a performance. It should be about the equipment you have. The rules should be about respecting the land, the experience of the visitors, the resources of the National Park Service, and not what kind of speech you are making while you are visiting that land. So why is this such a big deal to the National Park Service? Well, there is a problem, a problem that the National Park Service has had for a while. There are some activities that they don't like happening on public lands, that most of us don't like happening on public lands, that aren't technically illegal. Flying a drone, for instance. Now, flying a drone is one area where they can say, okay, this is a piece of equipment that is banned. This is not the same thing as saying what type of art you are making out of that equipment. It's saying that equipment is banned. 
for a good reason. We don't want to disrupt the visitor's experience. We don't want to disrupt the nature and wildlife's experience by flying drones overhead. The problem is the National Park Service doesn't have authority to govern the air. The FAA does, and the FAA has all kinds of rules that it has that allow you to fly over a national park. So the National Park Service says, okay, you can't operate a drone from a national park. You can't stand on national park land and hold the drone controller in your hand while you fly it overhead. What you can do is stand outside the border of the park and fly it overhead. So what can they do to stop people from doing that? Well, they can hit them with a fine for commercial filmmaking. National Park Service doesn't want people base jumping. Base jumping is where you jump off a cliff or a bridge with a parachute on you instead of jumping out of a plane. There's no law against it. So what does the National Park Service do? They find people for commercial filming. I get it. I get the problems they're trying to address. And I get that when I visit a national park and I'm holding my cell phone out and I'm filming my son hiking, there's not going to be a ranger coming up to me saying you can't do that or is that commercial or non-commercial. I get that. They might come to me after the fact, depending on what I say, I guess. But I like to set an example for my fellow content creators, for my fellow park visitors, for my children. I like to be a rule follower. I like to know what I'm doing is right and legal and do it. But two federal judges have told me that this law is unconstitutional. Two have said that it is constitutional. So I don't think it's really written in black and white. I think it's a lot of shades of gray. And for me going forward, as somebody who covers national parks and federal lands and shoots lots of video in them, including a video like this one, which happens to be inside my RV, but is on public land, I'm gonna to continue to do it. I'm not gonna stop. I'm happy if the government wants to come after me for that because I'm happy to continue that court fight to hopefully get some final resolution. I don't think the Park Service is gonna come after me because I'm not gonna be doing anything that's disrupting anybody's experience. I'm not gonna be doing anything different than the Instagrammer who's taking a photo of themselves, which is totally legal because it's a photo. I'm not gonna be doing anything different than that. And they know that. But the problem is that this feeds into so much more than taking a quick video at Yellowstone National Park of your hike with Aunt Edna. It involves all sorts of public lands it involves all sorts of activities. It involves the government restricting when and where we can't do something without an adequate reason. The fact that I might make some money off of it is not a good enough reason to restrict free speech. I'd love to know what you think about this in the comments. I think you're gonna see a lot fewer YouTubers and TikTokers filming on public lands, but I'm gonna to continue to do so. I'm not giving anybody legal advice here to do so because I am no lawyer, but I am going to continue to do so. And I hope if you are a content creator that you will leave in the comments below what you intend to do going forward. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for indulging my long-winded opinion. And I'll talk to you later.